Coming up on World Fishing Journal, it's called Tear Down. Probably the worst part of the job. We tell the story of these few critical days and see what happens when a remote fishing lodge is opened in the spring. I worry about everything, all winter long. One of the fastest growing youth related movements across the country are high school fishing clubs and Texas is booming. Are y'all ready? Let's go! And finally, we head to Las Vegas, quickly becoming the culinary capital of the world. You'll never guess how all of this seafood gets to Sin City. This is World Fishing Journal. Drive about four and a half hours north of Toronto and you'll arrive at the French River. Its name came from the local Algonquin people who associated it with the French explorers. The Algonquins used it for transportation until about 1820. Today, it's home to cottages and fishing lodges, like this one, Crane's Lock Haven Wilderness Lodge. It's owned and run by Ed and Sue Crane. I came on a, on a fishing vacation and I hired a guide and I married him. <laughs> Sue takes care of the business end of things and the kitchen, while Ed is responsible for the buildings and machinery. We provide all the meals, three, three meals a day. They're all home cooked. We provide the boats and motors, all your gas, your bait, your ice. So nothing's counted on the island. Every, everything's replenished. With seasonal businesses like this one, every day is important. Yet some of the most crucial days come after the paying guests have left. It's called tear down. Probably the worst part of the job. It's those few days at the end of the year when lodge owners have to pack everything up. My spring will be terrible if I don't tear down in the fall. You know, if you, if you can't fix it up in the fall, then you gotta do it in the spring. And it just all piles up. Everything must be cleaned and put away properly to avoid problems in the winter. Worried about roofs, worried about docks, worried about... <laughs> I worry about everything <laughs> all winter long. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking the generator's still running. <laughs> and I shut it off three months ago. <laughs> Animals are a major threat during the winter. We have had raccoons around six years ago. They got in and they make made one heck of a mess. So that's, uh, we would like to avoid that in the future. But raccoons aren't the biggest worry. The biggest fear is a bear getting in the kitchen because they won't just make a mess, they'll create damage and damage that would be time consuming to repair, uh, maybe even beyond repair. This means the fall cleaning of the dining and kitchen areas must be impeccable. If they don't smell anything, they, they have no encouragement to get in there. The dry goods are stored here on the island. So they're put away in our dry fridges and freezers. And then they're sealed shut. Anything that can freeze, like juices, canned tomatoes, anything that can freeze has to be shipped to um, the, bay, the bay, where we have a, a, another location, and uh, stored there where um, it's, it's heated during the winter. Each cabin on the island must be cleaned and torn down to make them as unappealing and inaccessible as possible to critters. Okay, Alaska, nobody's coming in anymore for the season, so it's close up time. Ed drains all the lodge's toilets to keep them from freezing. Any freeze deals with any excess water. The two miles of water pipe that crisscross the property also need to be shut off or disconnected. A lot of times you just, uh, you'll pull out these plugs, but on an older pump I really don't trust the threads anymore, so I disconnect it and dump it upside down. I'll get the well line. There's also plenty to do in the boathouse. The boats all must be power washed and scrubbed then taken to a safe area to be stored for the winter. All the motors need to be taken off the boats and the fluids drained. 
Now we're gonna drain the foot. We're gonna have a look. Check for water. You don't want any water in there. Watch you don't lose your washer. Always have a boo. If you got no leaks in your foot, it should just barely drip out. Like that. And that's perfect. Perhaps the area most vulnerable to the snow and ice is the lodge's large dock. This time of year, it's 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 fall. We're closed. I'm going to be gone for six months. I won't see the place for until mid-April, maybe maybe in the even the first of May. Uh, the water's probably going to change about six feet with ice on it. So the idea of moving the docks out rather than just leaving them in place is to disconnect them from the mainland so that when the ice cracks along the shoreline, it doesn't break the docks in half or break the hinges. Years ago, Ed wasn't as careful putting away the dock. During one winter, the ice and current combined to pull a piece of the dock away from the island. Ed eventually found it miles downstream. So we bring the docks back into the bay. It's out of the wind. It's an area that freezes faster because the island we're on is surrounded by current. So it's, it's a back bay, they freeze faster, they, they sit there before the snow gets on them and they won't sink. If they get snow on them before and they're out in the current, like they are right here, they'll sink. And that's not the best and you don't want that too much. Uh, if they're too close to shore, they break. So you have to suspend them out. That's why I used the old docks where we tied that one in, uh, kind of as bumpers. The last thing Ed must deal with is the literal engine of the lodge, the generator. It runs 24-7 for six months of the year. I only shut it down for oil changes, fuel filter changes, um, pretty much maintenance time, you know. But now I'm shutting her down. Hopefully I can sleep at night. <laughs> it's much easier when it's not running. But I love her. She's a good girl. Night, Irene. After days of planning and hard work, the teardown is complete. Another season at Crane's Lock Haven Lodge is officially over. We made it. That's the end. As long as you're not too twisted. The flagpole is Ed's pride and joy. He made it from hand from an old sailboat mast. Little did he know, but his beloved flagpole and a few other things would not survive the winter. It was a good thing that the crane spent so much time protecting the lodge from the winter elements. The winter of 2013-14 was long and cold and featured weeks of minus 40 degree temperatures. The bay leading to the French River remained frozen far longer than normal. It was the worst winter in decades, and it would leave its mark on the Lock Haven Lodge. When they freeze in the ice, and then the ice shifts, it breaks things, and this is what happened here. It's leaking in here. I'm gonna have to replace this whole corner. But given the time my opening, I've only got a week. Up next, Lake Travis High School fishing team is hosting its first tournament. The librarian, I remember she, she came up to us and she was like in awe of how awesome our jerseys were. And ordering seafood in Las Vegas isn't a gamble. Not with these restaurants and famous chefs. Lake Travis High School in Austin, Texas is a football powerhouse in a football crazy state. 
Its stadium is the envy of many universities, as is its state-of-the-art training facility. And it has a winning tradition that gives its players proverbial big men on campus status. At the other end of the high school celebrity scale, Tyler Anderson and the Lake Travis High School fishing team. <laughs> people usually are, I don't know, they know what these jerseys are, but you'll get a few new people each week that are like, whoa, what is that? Like, the librarian, I remember she, she came up to us and she was like in awe of how awesome our jerseys were. Throughout the country, the image of a teenager wearing a school fishing jersey is not as unusual as it may seem. It's probably the fastest growing American high school sport at the moment. In the last three years, the number of documented competitive high school anglers has gone from next to nothing to 10,000. Tyler is the president of the Lake Travis High School Fishing Team, a group he started up a little over a year ago. This weekend, with a little help from his father, Brian, his team will be hosting the first ever Lake Travis Cup. It takes a lot to organize a tournament, more than I ever thought. Sometimes I don't know which job I have, running a fishing tournament or selling real estate. As a lifelong water skier and wakeboarder, Brian Anderson never imagined he'd be running a fishing tournament for teenagers. It was hard when we transitioned from water skiing and water sports to fishing. Uh, quite honestly, I, I wanted a little bit more adrenaline. I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie, so I like the, uh, the, the barefooting, the wakeboarding, the jumps, the spins, and, and kind of the high energy stuff. So I didn't think bass fishing was going to have enough adrenaline for me. Brian even sold his water ski boat and used the money to purchase a fishing boat. That was a huge sacrifice for my dad. And so, uh, I, mean, I love my dad so much, and so I, I can't thank him I mean, enough for, you know. He said that since he only has, when he sold the boat, he only had three years left of high school with me. And so, if he wanted to spend the rest of the time making memories with me, The Lake Travis Cup has attracted 51 high school anglers, representing seven schools from the Central Texas region. Are y'all ready? Let's go! Among the competitors, Marble Falls, the first high school fishing team in the Central Texas area. We had six students at the time, and uh, we started one, and there weren't any other high school teams here in Central Texas at the time. So we um, started growing, and then, um, so that was two years ago. Today we have 62 kids on our team, and we have five high schools represented in the Central Texas area. Lorna Ellis credits the Student Angler Federation for the success of the Marble Falls program. The organization was created in 2007 to help promote fishing and conservation among high school aged anglers. The SAF is important to building high school competitive teams because it creates that turnkey program. There's nothing that they need to do other than follow the layout that we've given them. It took us a long time to build that program, but we've combined the insurance coverage, the fundraising, the online education materials, and then building that series of state and competitive events. We'll run over 60 high school championships this year between our state championships and our opens. And so that program, having that package that they can just plug in the details and go, is what makes it easy and simple for them to get involved. Over the last few years, the Student Angler Federation has helped create over 600 high school fishing programs. The teams also rely on local businesses for support. In Lake Travis High School's case, it's Austin Boat and Motors. The high school fishing program, I think, is just huge. It's, it's, a, it's just a, a, a breeding ground for the sport to get kids at that age interested in something um, I just think that there's just a, a lot of power in that, and we want to be a part of that. Um, getting the kids on the water is something that's always been important to our company. It's a cold day on Lake Travis, with temperatures hovering around the freezing mark. Yet despite the frigid conditions, there are plenty of boats on the water. Some are manned by two students, while many have parent volunteers. Today's kids, they just want a chance to be 
uh, you know, in connection with their families. And, and you don't get that in, in football and volleyball and baseball. It's, it's more you with the other kids out on the field and separation. And when you talk about being in a, in a fishing environment as it is, you've got a, a parent sponsor who's in the boat, a, a parent uh, with his son and then one other angler. And that time there, I think, has just become more important to today's kids. Besides allowing kids more time with their families, it's also the type of sport that is open to virtually any student. You can be good at it without having size. You can be good at it without having money. You know, and you can be good at it just because you, it's something you connect with. By the end of the day, the results from Lake Travis are mixed. One pound, 13 ounces. The fishing has been difficult but most teams manage to bring in at least a couple of keepers. Perhaps, not surprisingly, the tournament host does particularly well. The award for big bass at two pounds, 14 ounces, Tyler Anderson. He and his partner Watt also win the team category and Lake Travis finishes the day as the top school. Cold weather aside, the tournament is a success. All the competitors have a great time. And for more ambitious young anglers, it also has another function. As the professional fishing world matures, these high school events have become a starting point for kids dreaming of a career in fishing's big time. The big boys are fishing, the colleges are fishing. Now the kids in high school want to be a part of it. So this is how they, they can do it. Still to come on World Fishing Journal, from the sea to the strip, Las Vegas loves seafood. The nearest ocean is hundreds of miles away. And words like seafood sanctuary don't necessarily come to mind when you think of the Las Vegas desert. Over the years, the reputation of Las Vegas continues to evolve, besides being known as a glitzy and glamorous gambling mecca and a 24-7 party paradise of buffets and entertainment. The Strip is rapidly competing for the title of culinary capital of the world, with award-winning internationally recognized restaurants like RM Seafood at Mandalay Bay, Bartolota Restaurante at Wynn, Emerald's Fish House at MGM, Nobu at Caesars Palace and Hard Rock Hotel proves that ordering seafood in the Vegas desert isn't a gamble at all. Here's a former Top Chef master to help guide us through the journey of your dinner from surf to turf. Hi, my name is Rick Moonen and I am the executive chef and owner of Rick Moonen's RM Seafood and Rick's Boiler Room. It may seem a little bit strange that being in the middle of the desert that we have access to amazingly fresh and high quality seafood, but we do. It's an amazing source of demand for fresh, high quality seafood. And it wasn't always that. You know, years ago, you know, it was about inexpensive, cheap, you know, buffet, dining, just to get some protein into the, uh, into the, the gamblers. So much more has developed and evolved in Las Vegas. There's an enormous, ridiculous amount of seafood consumed on a daily basis, and the numbers are astounding. According to the National Marine Fishery Service, the U.S. consumes almost five times more fish than it did 100 years ago. In Las Vegas alone, 60,000 pounds of shrimp were devoured daily. That translates to almost 22 million pounds annually which is more than anywhere else in the world. That's a whole lot of shrimp cocktail. Also, close to 1.5 million tons of salmon were consumed last year, and distributors paid top dollar for the freshest product. There's a saying that a fish travels more after it's caught than when it's in the water. So how exactly does this massive amount of fish get to Vegas? My name is Rick Hergott. 
I am the president of Hergot Trading Company. The expectation in the bar is very, very high here. Uh, we are an international destination. We have international flights coming in and out of Las Vegas, Nevada, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This is not just a gambling mecca anymore. It's now a fine dining mecca of the world. Back in the day, people were relying more on frozen products from different parts of the world, you know, where it would take three, four, five days to get here. Now we can have stuff literally on the plate 24 hours out of the water. So let's reel in the breakdown of how your specialty seafood ends up on your plate. The fishermen are out fishing for unique items. They fish for three or four days at a time. Once they catch the uh, product, they bring it back to the auction. From there, the, uh, the fish goes out on auction floors and it is flown in six days a week. From there, we send our trucks to the airport to uh, pick up the product. This is the uh, Scottish salmon that's just flown in from Scotland, roughly about a 15 pound fish. You can see how red the gills are and how it's still bleeding on the inside. And this will be on somebody's plate this evening for dinner. Superstar celebrity chef Emeril Lagasse, who has four restaurants in Las Vegas, kicks it up a notch with his take on how we get the freshest fish options on the strip. The thing that has made Las Vegas cuisine so incredible is the proximity of how close we are to Los Angeles and those trucks coming in every day with this amazing produce, amazing fish, uh, amazing proteins. It's, it's really great. Vegas also has one of the world's most recognized Japanese restaurants. Nobu executive chef Frank Gorosita at the Hard Rock Hotel, which is known for its hip crowd, celebrity clientele, and of course, top grade sushi. All the chefs all over the world, best chef are all here. At first, it's a big question mark. Wow, desert, fresh fish, raw fish. How could you market that? But you did it 14 years ago, and we're here for 14 years. Back at Mandalay Bay at RM Seafood, Chef Muin is gathering his top of the line ingredients and has exclusive tips on how he prepares his famous seafood chowder. The most important thing to a successful clam chowder is having real clams. You need to really, really rinse them until the water runs clear. So I place them into the pan and I add just a, a touch more liquid to create a steamy environment. Every so often I'll give it a shake. It's like making Jiffy Pop popcorn. In a second pot, we need to start off because we're going to make what they call a roux. Dice up smoky, delicious bacon. So while that's rendering, I'm going to make a little package or a sachet of aromatics. Take a piece of cheesecloth. We're going to add some a bay leaf, some peppercorns, a couple pieces of garlic, and some parsley. So that gets thrown in with the bacon right from the get-go. So I'm going to start adding some vegetables, onions, celery, I like to add a little bit of carrot because I like the sweetness and the color. Okay, we're going to back to the clams. They're opening up now nicely. You see them smiling open. So we're going to strain the juice. At the bottom of this colander is the juice that's going to give us the aroma of the ocean. It's all packed right in there. Now our clams have had a chance to cool off. Fresh clams is the bomb and the diggity. I'm going to cut them in half or put them in, cut them in quarter so that you have uh, clams in every bite of your chowder. Now we want to add the liquid we extracted from the fresh clam. I'm going to add a little bit of cream to it. I'm going to add some potatoes. And okay, now we want to remove our sachet, which is filled with the yum-yums from the chowder. That's a technical term. Add your herbs. Add the clams. Bring it to one quick simmer, and your clam chowder is ready to serve up. As seafood splurges rise and the traveler's palate evolves, Las Vegas can most definitely handle the demand with its world-class options in both casual and fine dining. You might almost forget that you're in fact in the middle of the desert. For more videos exclusive to the web and past stories from World Fishing Journal, be sure to check out worldfishingnetwork.com slash WFJ.